All right, so let's talk about quantum computing for a second. And so imagine trying to solve complex problems that it takes a general supercomputer longer than the age of the universe to solve. That's a general supercomputer longer than the age of the universe to solve. And I think it's important to think about that for a second because for a long time now, problems around climate change, energy generation, and drug discovery have been so difficult to solve that the current computers we have today just don't have the capacity and the bandwidth to solve them. And so this is where it becomes really interesting where in recent weeks, Google announced that they released a revolutionary quantum computer chip called Willow. And this chip is very interesting in many ways. And I wanna go deeper into what this actually means for all of us. So today I wanna to spend some time talking about Willow, talking about quantum computing, and I wanna talk about what makes quantum computing so unique and interesting. So before we jump in, I realized that 98% of the viewers who come on this channel are not subscribed. So if you are one of those viewers, thank you for stopping by. And if you do like the topics I talk about, go ahead and subscribe. Next time you will get notified when new content like this comes out. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So before diving in, I think it's important to understand how basic computers work. So the computers on your phone, your laptop, your Tesla, your smartphone, all those smart devices have computers running on them. And on those devices are computer processing chips. And the way it works is that a lot of it runs on switches. So think of it as an on and off switch. And these switches have two states, zero and one. But the thing is that a lot of these devices right now are operating on zero and ones at any given time. So if you have a switch, it only can be a zero or it could only be a one. And there's hundreds and hundreds of billions of, of these switches working together to basically produce a calculation or work on an instruction to display the weather on your phone. It could be taking you to your next destination. So those are what classical computers operate at the fundamental level. Now, the fundamental building blocks of these types of switches are called transistors. And the thing about transistors is that they're incredibly small and they're getting smaller every day, every year. The problem is that these transistors can only get smaller until a certain point. And beyond that point is where quantum effects start to happen. And this is where the weird stuff happens. And you've probably heard about quantum physics and quantum entanglement and tunneling, things existing in multiple places at once. This is where it gets really, really funky. So quantum computing takes advantage of that. And in a way they're called qubits. So you've got the bit, which is the classical way, which is just zero and one, and now you have the qubit. But the interesting thing about the qubit is that it operates in multiple states. So it's not just a zero and a one, it could be a zero one simultaneously. So this is an interesting phenomenon that we call superposition. And this is where quantum computing really gets its edge, its ability to process more, store more. The fact that it's not just operating on this binary state of zero and one, it now understands and can operate on multiple states simultaneously. Now, the way it works is kind of weird and we'll take a deeper dive into that later on. But for now, it's important to understand the differences between classical computers, the bit, and the quantum computers, the qubit. So the interesting thing about Willow, it's that it's a quantum computer chip that we haven't yet seen before because it's created a fundamental breakthrough in the way that we process data, but also in the way that we error check the data as well. Firstly, it has more qubits than ever before. It has 105 qubits. It has better stability. So this stability is something called coherence. And stability is incredibly important when you want to make sure that the quantum computer operates and functions as a regular computer. But the thing is that about quantum computers, it requires extreme stability and it needs to operate close to zero degrees in temperature. And it needs to have coherence. And that's what Quilla, that's what Willow has demonstrated. It has showcased that ability to have better coherence than all its predecessors. So here's the interesting thing about Willow, and it all comes down to error correction. So basically with classical computers, right, you have the zero and one bit. Uh, when you increase the number of bits in processing, in transmission, when you're trying to communicate, you're going to introduce more errors. And there are certain ways we can check for those errors. 
but in quantum computers, as you increase the number of qubits, it actually gets better in error checking. So let's explain by using this diagram, okay? So you've got three, you've got three grids. You've got a three by three, a five by five, and a seven by seven grid, as you can see. Now, as the number of qubits go up, you have a sort of a, a partition. There's a, there's a group that are the data bits, the data qubits, and then there's another group, which are the checkers, the error checker qubits, and they all work together. So as the surface area or the surface code area of the grid goes up and up, the error checking gets better and better and better because it means that there's more error checking qubits to compensate for the data qubits that might go awry when there are errors. There's always a team effort in error checking and error correction, right? So that's why it's really interesting for quantum computers and Willow specifically, because as you increase the number of qubits and your processing goes up, your storage goes up, error checking gets better and better. And that's really, really interesting to see. So now the other animation, you can actually see the grids increase in size over time and you can see the blues and the red qubits working together so whenever there's a error that comes up the blue qubits or the blue error checker qubits will come in and will fix that error that's the really interesting thing so the interesting about willow now is that because it's been able to demonstrate this phenomenon on increase on better performing error checking as the size of the grid goes up it also means that you can now scale quantum chips as well that's really incredible. You can now scale the size of these quantum chips to produce more powerful computers in the future. And this is the inflection point that I was talking about earlier, is that Willow was able to achieve this through this error checking feature. And now it's going to pave the way and open the gates up for fast processing beyond our imagination and storage capabilities as well. And one thing to note here is that Google, when testing the Willow chip, came upon something interesting in their compute times. And they put the chip against something called an RCS sampling benchmark. And RCS basically means random circuit sampling. It's basically a way to test the quality and performance of a quantum computer chip. And what they found was that Willow was able to solve this in five minutes. But just take a look at how long it would have taken a general supercomputer to solve this RCS sampling benchmark. By our best estimates, a calculation that takes Willow under five minutes would take the fastest supercomputer 10 to the 25 years. That's a one with 25 zeros following it, or a time scale way longer than the age of the universe. This result highlights the exponentially growing gap between classical and quantum computation for certain applications. So why is this even possible? How does this even actually work? Well, it's still debatable. It is still a lot of theories up in the air about how is Willa able to perform so much better than the current state-of-the-art supercomputers we have today. And there's been a lot of talk around the multiverse. And just to give you a sense, the multiverse is basically, you know, a multitude of universes that coexist in parallel. So there might be a version of me and there might be another version of me in another universe, right? Still has yet to be proven, but what a lot of people are saying today is that the reason why quantum computers can operate in the way they do is going back to the superposition principle that we initially spoke about with these qubits is that they can simultaneously coexist in parallel in multiple universes at the same time. And this was put forth by a famous physicist called David Deutsch, and he said that there is a possibility that quantum computation occurs in many parallel universes in line with the idea that we live in a multiverse. So that's really, really important to think about because it paves the way for how quantum computing actually works. And again, there needs to be a lot more testing that needs to be conducted, but it really is exciting to hear about that. All of these calculations Billions and trillions of these calculations are happening simultaneously in parallel universes and then eventually coming down and coming back to our current universe in coming up with that answer, which is pretty mind-blowing. So what does the roadmap look like for Willow and just quantum computers in general? So 
One thing to note is that we are currently in milestone two, based on this diagram from Google's quantum group. And milestone one was basically with the predecessor called Sycamore, it had 54 qubits. It was basically just proving quantum compute was feasible, right? The fact that you were able to perform these very, very powerful calculations. But the thing is that with milestone one and even milestone two, we haven't got to a point where we can actually scale this out to operate in a device that we currently take for granted today, right? And so with milestone three, this is where quantum computer scientists are trying to now extend the life of a qubit because it all comes down to stability, right? It's great to know that these things are immensely powerful, but there's no use if these things cannot exist for a longer period of time. And this is where milestone three is becoming more crucial to allowing us to understand what this means for quantum computers. Milestone four is creating, being able to create all of these sort of logical gates. You've probably heard of AND gates and OR gates. These gates are basically comprised of these basic switches, these on and off switches in classical computers. What quantum computer scientists want to do the same. They want to create the analogous version of those gates for quantum computers so that now you can create more complex circuits, you can create more complex logic. And then five and six is really where it really takes off. So once we're able to figure out how to create these logical gates, then it's really off to the races at that point. And then we can then figure out how do we stabilize it? How do we put this into a microchip and putting this into a computer that will then be able to generate uh, calculations for us built software on top of it that will solve these really difficult challenges that we spoke about, whether it be climate change, energy generation, drug discovery, space travel. Uh, that's really exciting. Uh, and I'm super stoked to continue following this space. And as new information comes to light, I'll certainly share it on this channel. But if you do like this channel, as I said, give it a like, give it a subscribe, and I hope to see you in the next video. All right, bye-bye.